This special episode of the Bitcoin Show is brought to you by Mt. Gox, M-T-G-O-X dot com and bit-pay dot com, B-I-T-Pay dot com and Mezzy Grill, M-E-Z-E Grill dot com and Bitbrew, Bitbrew dot net, not dot com. I'm on the next slide after this one. So in April of 
April 25th, BitcoinMarket.com was launched. That was the first Bitcoin exchange, I believe. I heard there might have actually been an earlier Bitcoin exchange, but this was all before my time. Um, in May 2010, a pizza was sold on the Bitcoin forums for 10,000 Bitcoins, which was one of the very first Bitcoins for something physical, valuable transactions. And I first heard about Bitcoin from this article, which came out in InfoWorld on May 24th, 2010, which was an article about seven interesting open source projects. Uh, I don't remember how I stumbled across the article. It's probably one of the many blogs I read linked to it. So uh, about a month later, I had launched the Bitcoin faucet, which probably all got a, a few, well, depending on how early you were, uh, either five Bitcoins, which is how many Bitcoins the faucet was getting ready to start, or if you got them last night, then one micro Bitcoin, which is how much the faucet is giving out today. Um, so when I heard about that article in May and uh, decided the faucet would be a great first project to kind of get my feet wet in playing with Bitcoins, I just kind of got sucked in and, and got more and more involved in the project, got involved in the Bitcoin forums and the community, started to submit patches to Satoshi, who would then rip them apart and send them back to me and say, no, you did it wrong and re-implement it. Um, all the way through kind of December 2010, when Satoshi started to step backwards. And uh, he did it in an interesting way. He, uh, he actually sent me an email and asked me if it would be okay if, if he could put my email address as one of the people to contact on the Bitcoin.org homepage. I said, sure, yeah, no problem. You can put my Bitcoin address there. And so he did that. Um, and then at the same time, he took his email address away. <laughs> which I didn't expect to happen. Um, but I think it was kind of his way of saying, kind of pushing me forward. And uh, the last email I have got from Satoshi was in April of 2011. Um, so that kind of gives you a history of of the project so far. So why me? Why, why am I the lead developer of Bitcoin? Well, Jeff pushed me. Um, he kind of encouraged me. I think because I have a pretty thick skin, so you can call me an idiot and um, yeah, whatever. Uh, because I know I'm not perfect, so I, I, I tend not to rush into things rashly because I screw up quite regularly. But I think my virtue is that I will listen to you if you tell me I'm screwing up. Um, and also because nobody else, frankly, stepped forward and decided to, to say, yeah, I'll be the guy who tries to hurt the cats. I should stress it's not because of any prior experience in either open source software or the financial world. Uh, my background is in kind of the serial entrepreneur and a bunch of different startups. Um, although I did have a, pre previous, pre a prior experience it actually reminds me a lot of Bitcoin in that side was um, kind of the chief architect of the virtual reality modeling language standard, which never actually kind of went anywhere. But just dealing with a very diverse community and trying to get people to agree on kind of what the direction to go in, uh, my here experience reminds me a lot of Bitcoin. So I guess I do have some semi-relevant prior experience. So in my view, the priorities for core Bitcoin are first stability and then scalability. So just making sure the system keeps chugging away, processing transactions, even though we're getting, you know, hundreds of thousands of new people joining, downloading the client, trying to connect to the network every month. Uh, that's my number one priority is just to try to keep it stable and keep it scaling up. The second is security. So when I talk about security, I mean both security of the core system and kind of security for everybody's wallets is uh, second priority. The third is you know bugs, making sure that things are relatively bug free and down at the bottom of my list actually are usability and new features. Now why that? Well, stability first because it affects everybody. Who cares if your wallet is secure if you can't spend the money in it, right? Even if the Bitcoin network just implodes, uh, you know, the whole thing grinds to a halt. So stability and kind of sc scalability has to be way near the top of the list. Security second, because trust is crucial. We've had a lot of incidents in the last few months that have really shaken trust for a lot of people. Um, core Bitcoin has remained trustworthy, and I'm actually 
really pleased at that. I mean, the, the core kind of payment system network has continued to chug along. I had lunch a couple of days ago with somebody who asked, well, who runs the Bitcoin network? Is there from the you know, Visa credit card processing industry where you know, there are fleets of people? And really, it is quite amazing that we have this bottom-up network where there is nobody running the network. It's all of the miners, it's all of the merchants, it's all of the geeks all over the world who are just coming together and cooperating, and, and it works. Um, bugs I put third because buggy software is usually unstable and insecure. So fixing bugs is extremely high priority. And features and usability really last because easy to use but insecure software is a really bad idea. So I think part of what we've seen over the last few months is maybe people spending too much time on making their software easy to use and not enough time making sure that it's you know, really secure in the back end. I get a lot of pressure to kind of add features or make things more usable. Um, and people ask me, don't you care about end users? And I mean, I do care about end users. But I don't particularly care a lot about people who download the Bitcoin software and then run it and then complain that it looks ugly. Um, really because I believe that the desktop is dying, right? that the, the whole model of downloading software onto your desktop computer and then running it is just over. I think it's all going to be mobile devices and websites. And so if you if you kind of track the things I've been working on, you know, I, I've I've been concentrating on features that make it easier for merchants. Um, I will be concentrating on features that, that make it possible to, to run Bitcoin on interesting devices and uh, do it in a secure, scalable way. Don't I care about miners? Um, well, really, no, um, quite frankly. I, uh, I mean, you know, mining is a zero-sum game, right? So if we make it easier for more miners to, to start trying to generate Bitcoins, um, that really doesn't do a whole lot for the system. So unless it affects the stability or scalability of the system, you know, I don't really spend a whole lot of time thinking about supporting mining pools or making it easier for individual miners to generate bitcoins. It just uh, it's not on my priority list. Closer? Ooh, that is loud. Um, so I, I want to go for where are we at? What's the status? Um, the network is a little shaky right now. Um, there were some problems we had scaling up. Uh, we filled up our RRC channel that nodes use to connect to each other. We've got a hack-in that uh, to kind of split people up into different IRC channels. Um, Jeff did some great work on uh, seeding by a different mechanism so people can connect to each other easily. Um, so that's kind of solved the, the, the short-term problems. Um, finding other computers that are actually listening for Bitcoin connections. Um, that's been a little bit of a, an issue. And uh, we've done a couple things enabling universal plug and play so people's ports on their routers are opened by default. You can turn it off if you don't like that. Um, but one critical need that I really hope somebody steps up to, feel, to fill is kind of a network health monitor. So somebody who, you know, daily or weekly is looking at, I see Andrew nodding. Um, you might have volunteered, cool. Um, but somebody who just keeps track of, you know, our, our, do we have islands of, of, of peers that are not connected? Is it taking a long time for transactions to travel from one part of the network to another? And all those other sorts of things that, that I really want somebody to take charge of figuring out how to measure and keeping track of it over time so that if you know, bad things start happening, we can react to it and figure out why. Um, core security so far has been really good. I mean, Satoshi did a fantastic job. Um, there's been more scrutiny. I know Jacob Applebaum of the Tor Project had a tweet a while ago where he said, expect to see a bunch of interesting news surrounding Bitcoin. That tweet was because he knew that there are a couple of really good security researchers who are going to take a hard look at Bitcoin. The good news is they didn't find anything. So there have cool. been, I, I was actually contacted by them and uh, talked through a couple of the features of the system, but so far so good. I mean, Dan Kaminsky you, uh, did a talk at Black Hat where he talked about Bitcoin. He actually contacted me a little bit beforehand because he thought he might have found a vulnerability. Turned out not so much. 
So, and he, he told me that was the eighth vulnerability he thought he had found. It turned out not to be a vulnerability because something in the Bitcoin code prevented it from being taken advantage of. So, there have been no significant problems found. As far as we can tell, core Bitcoin is secure. Uh, I just jinxed my slide. <laughs> so, you might ask, well, what about Mt. Gox, my Bitcoin, viruses, Trojans? All of that stuff is... is... Sorry, I upset you. Uh, all, of... <laughs> all of that stuff is um, not core Bitcoin. I mean, there is there are a bunch of security issues kind of surrounding, you know, services that use Bitcoin. But as far as we know, the core is pretty secure. Now, I do have some... Well, I'll get to my worries later. I have another slide on my worries. Bugs are my biggest headache. And quality assurance is my biggest headache. All right now, I think there are something like 30 or 40 patches, which are, you know, changes to code that people want to get into core Bitcoin. Um, there's a huge bottleneck because I don't know if they've been tested properly. I don't know if they're secure. You know, if it's a really simple, like, fix a comment kind of patch, no problem, I can read that code, pull it. If it's anything larger, you know, I really need a quality assurance manager who will take care of looking at the bug list, closing bugs when they get fixed, who will take care of looking at patches, pulling them, testing them, you know, sending feedback to developers saying, you know, I found these six bugs, you know, your patch doesn't fly. Um, if you know anybody who would be a good quality assurance person, somebody who's passionate about Bitcoin and who knows about quality assurance testing, talk to me. I think we can find money to hire that person to be the person who, you know, is responsible for telling me, you know, here's a test plan. It's been tested. This patch is ready to go. Because, um, quite frankly, I'm not the right person to do that. Um, but we need somebody who will step up and do that. The other big thing that's happening is we're getting alternative Bitcoin implementations, right? So we started with Satoshi's code. That was Bitcoin. That was the only thing that Bitcoin was. Um, other people are re-implementing Bitcoin in all sorts of different languages, on all sorts of different platforms, which is a fantastic thing. I fully support that. We just need to have a good test plan to make sure that the alternative implementations don't screw things up. Um, so usability and features. And the very next release, 0.4 release, which will happen as soon as we fix the bugs in it, um, has wallet encryption. So you can enter a passphrase and the private keys in your, in your wallet will be protected by that passphrase. So even if somebody gets your, your wallet file, unless they also get your passphrase, uh, your, your, your bitcoins will be secure. The next couple things that actually are on the, the short list because we already have code for them um, are importing and exporting private keys. So this is the idea of, you know, I have some bitcoins in, in this wallet here. Instead of sending them over the network, um, you could export the private keys and import them into some other wallet. Um, people have been asking that for a long time. And um, doing some usability stuff. So John Smith has a... Um, graphical user interface that uses a different toolkit and it's just much nicer. I mean, one of the problems we've been having is nobody likes the user interface toolkit that Satoshi chose. WX Widgets is... I don't know of anybody who stands up and says, yeah, that's the one we should be using. So, um, after the 0 0.4 release, the plan is to, to move to this you know, nicer, prettier Bitcoin. Um, yeah, I want to talk a little bit more about wallet encryption to make sure that people don't get their hopes too far up. Um, like I said, it encrypts a wallet with a passphrase, and to spend the coins, you must enter a passphrase. So it's, it's, you can look at your Bitcoin balance, have your Bitcoin running, you don't enter your passphrase until it's actually time to you know, hook that send button. You can receive Bitcoins, no problem. It's just the send side. Um, it protects from dumb copy wallet.dat trojans. Um, it protects from, you know, backing up your wallet someplace um, unencrypted um, and having somebody find that backup because, you know, the wallet keys will always be encrypted on disk. Um, and it, it, it protects also from kind of casual, you know, I left Bitcoin running on my 
desktop computer and a coworker noticed and he so he decided to run over and send himself my whole Bitcoin balance and then you know ran away. So it'll protect from that kind of casual theft. It will not protect from a Trojan running on your computer. Because as soon as you type in your passphrase, that Trojan can see what keystrokes you're typing and um, get your passphrase, get your wallet, and uh, compromise your Bitcoins. So, it's theoretically impossible for kind of a computer to protect itself. You can't like install some software on your computer that no matter how complicated you make it will prevent other software running on that same computer from, from stealing your bitcoins or stealing your private keys. It just is not possible. And I'll talk about what is possible in a little bit. So, top of my wish list is the two-device transaction verification. So, if the private keys aren't stored on your computer, if they're stored on your computer and also on your cell phone or on your computer and also with a web wallet service, then you can get secure, um, you know, a very secure wallet where a hacker would have to both hack into your computer and hack into your cell phone to steal your bitcoins or hack into your computer and hack into uh, you know, your online wallet service provider. So that's very high on my list, just from a security standpoint, to, to enable that to happen. Um, dynamic transaction fees is, is another thing that's very high on my list. Um, we've had a lot of complaints about transaction fees. Um, so we were kind of, we, we, frankly, we were taken by surprise by the huge run-up in Bitcoin prices from, you know, under a dollar uh, last year to over $30. And so the hard-coded transaction fees that we have um, just were inappropriate, right? It was, uh, you know, point 0.1 of a Bitcoin, is that right? Excuse me, point zero one 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 bit penny, which turns out if Bitcoins are worth, you know, $30 a piece, that's, that's a fair chunk of change, you know, that's, that's 30 cents. So, um, that could happen again, you know. I mean, I think we all hope that Bitcoins will go from $10 to $1,000, but if it happens too quickly, we're going to have exactly the same problem with transaction fees, and the, the current transaction fees we can have won't be right. So um, there's some, there's a bunch of design work that needs to be done. We need to figure out you know, how do we how do we create a, essentially a market between miners and clients that, that makes the transaction fees work themselves out to the right level so that, you know, so me and, and you know, the three other people who have access, uh-oh, okay, yeah, that's better. Um, so me and the, the other people who have, you know, the, the clients shouldn't be deciding what the transaction fees are, that should be kind of a market-based thing. Um, another thing I'd really like to see is a semi-trusted kind of network backbone where, you know, the big miners and the big merchants connect directly to each other um, and, and exchange transactions and have more trust that the transactions they're, they're exchanging are actually valid transactions and aren't somebody trying to hack into the network that, that, uh, that uh, somebody trying to, you know, perform some attack on them by uh, controlling all of the nodes that they're connected to. Because one of the big things on my worry list are denial of service attacks of various kinds. You know, I said poor Bitcoin is secure. Well, it is, but I believe there are potential denial of service attacks um, where you know we could you could target a particular node and maybe combined with a civil attack, which is where you try to control all of the connections to that node. You could um, you could really mess it up. You could have it spend all of its time verifying bogus transactions, or you could ha have it spend all of this time, you know, doing other useless work um, just because you, you know, decided you didn't like where it was running at in that particular Bitcoin node. Um, the third thing on my worry list actually is um, incentives for relaying transactions. So, I mean, right now, kind of everybody, you know, you take transactions in, you send the transactions back out, um, everybody's being good network citizens and, and relaying all the transactions that they get, but really, there's nothing in the system that says you have to. 
So if I wanted to, I can take transactions in and then just drop them on the floor that happen to be convenient for me. Um, that would be bad for the network. And as we get alternative implementations happening, I'm worried that maybe somebody will take a shortcut, or maybe some miners will decide, well, maybe it'd be better for me if the other miners didn't know about this transaction. So I'll get it, and I'll just keep it for myself, and I won't tell anybody else about it. So I think we need, there's some work to be done to, to work out some either incentives or disincentives um, for relaying transactions to make sure that transactions make it to, to you know, all across the network. And I think that can be done. What am I actually personally working on? So recently I've been working on cross-implementation test suite. So the idea is as we get new implementations of, of the Bitcoin protocol, you know, how do we know that, that they're behaving themselves? And how do we know that they won't misbehave themselves um, if they get weird inputs or, or whatever? So I've actually been working on a framework to uh, kind of test the, 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 the different Bitcoin implementations at a high level. Um, and of course, I'll, I'll test the Bitcoin we have now at a high level, um, which will be a, a really good first step, too. Um, if you have started up a new Bitcoin node and tried to download the blockchain, it's a horrible experience. It's terrible. It takes days, or can take days. Um, so I've also been working a little bit on a faster initial download. So Satoshi had a design for, you know, once you can join the network and just download the block headers. Um, and it's much, much, much faster. Um, so making the initial download faster is certainly high on the list. Um, on a meta level, watching for more talented and trustworthy people to help out. Um, so if you know anybody, if you are talented and trustworthy, you know, start submitting patches. You know, let them know that you would like to help pull patches. Because um, we do need uh, we do need more people in addition to that QA person who I really 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 want, um, and then just in general embrace and encourage responsible implementation diversity. So you know encourage experiments, encourage you know different clients. Because I expect specialization. I mean the Satoshi Bitcoin client right was this Windows executable that did everything. It accepted transactions, it sent transactions, it could create Bitcoins. It was, you know, everything in one package. We should expect, and, and we are seeing a lot more specialization. So we'll see specialized versions of Bitcoin for mining pools, for big merchants, for big e-wallet providers, uh, and even for end users. I expect to see, you know, lots of diversity in you know, the version of Bitcoin that you're using on your cell phone or, or whatever. Um, and the general idea for kind of core Bitcoin is to to make it smaller, to, to, to move towards you know a really well defined little core that everybody can be confident you know does everything correctly and can be kind of a reference implementation that people build on top of. So we're taking small baby steps um, towards that. Um, it won't be perfect, but um, I think we'll get there eventually. So that's kind of the state of the project at a, at a pretty technical level. Feel free to send me an email. Tell me I'm an idiot. Tell me I should care about miners. Um, tell me whatever you like. And why don't I just take like five minutes to answer any questions if anybody has burning questions. Yeah. The question was, who is Satoshi? Anybody? Anybody? I really don't know. He's, he's not he's not the author of Bitcoin, but another fellow by the same name is. Sagan. <laughs> it's, it's an old joke about who's Shakespeare. Um, Shakespeare's not the author of the works in the library called Works of Shakespeare, but another fellow by the same name is. Why did Satoshi back out? Why did Satoshi back out? He said he was busy doing other projects. <laughs> <laughs> Is, um, is random. I mean, it is it is it is me pulling a patch, uh, kind of trying to judge how much testing has been happening based on what other people are saying in IRC or by email, um, and for me to personally, you know, kind of do some sanity tests to make sure you know does this actually work for me. Um, you know, I will if 
for example, I am uh, running an encrypted wallet on the Bitcoin faucet right now, um, which gives me some confidence that you know it didn't screw up the, the send out transaction. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, it needs to get better, and that's why that's you know, my, my highest priority thing to, to start getting. Right. Uh, where would you like to see Bitcoin in five years in terms of its uh, use within like the economy and the real world how to help people who aren't into the tech and open source projects, how they relate to Bitcoin? Bitcoin in five years? I hope in five years Bitcoin is really boring. That, that I am not getting called by reporters because kind of Bitcoin is old news. Kind of like, uh, you know, I talked to a... Um, talked to a reporter who was trying to do an article about Wikipedia, which was big news five years ago, you know, this idea of an encyclopedia that everybody's editing. Um, now his editor said that Wikipedia is boring. Uh, I would like Bitcoin to be at the same place where we all come to this conference and we're all still interested in it, but everybody else, oh yeah, Bitcoin is just, just that internet currency that just kind of works and is used in these five or six niches maybe and is continued to grow and be stable. That's what I would like to see in five years. Yeah. Do you think that the future of Bitcoin is in the standing alone and by itself as an intended currency, or do you think it will tend to be an intermediary currency by means of conducting transactions? Do I think Bitcoin will be an intermediate currency or a standalone currency? I don't know. <laughs> So you mentioned what Dan Kaminsky said at Black Hat, and he didn't find any like security flaws, but he did kind of give a grim prediction for the future of scalability for Bitcoin, where he said he thought it was going to end up with these sort of mammoth, just sort of like banks who are supporting the entire structure. What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, um, well, on one level, you know, if that happens, that's okay with me. Uh, you know, as long as there, there's, there's enough competition across the world, and I think there will be, you know, I think it's hard to imagine that, you know, Bank of America will be the Bitcoin processor. Maybe it'll be Bank of America and some bank in the UK and some bank in Asia and some bank in Africa. And, I, you know, I think we would still have a system better than the system we have today. So, you know, on one level, even if, even if you know, that comes true, which I'm not sure it will, um, I think that would be okay. And, and it, you know, Scalability is funny because it's one of those good problems to have, right? You know, if, if, if we really do have the problem of, you know, there are too many transactions for a home DSL line to, to handle, <coughs> cool, you know, great, you know, that's a fantastic problem to have. Um, so I, I tend not to worry about problems that are really good to have. Yeah. Quick question, uh, what do you think of an on-screen randomized keyboard for the keylogger problem? An on-screen randomized keyboard for the keylogger problem. Did you ever play Whack-A-Mole? Because, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's, that, that's, right, you whack down that guy, and then the Trojans get your keys out of memory of the running process after you've done your typing. Or they hack the screen display routine so that it says you're sending 10 bitcoins to your grandma, and really you're sending 10,000 bitcoins to some guy in Russia, right? And you don't know, you've still entered your passphrase using whatever complicated thing. So, you know, I'm, 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 I try not to find whack-a-mole solutions. Because um, you just get on this path of always trying to, to fix the next hack. So I, I think you need, it really needs to be fixed at a more fundamental level. Which is why the idea of having your know, private keys stored on different devices and having verification on different devices, I think, is, is really the way to go. Are there any concepts from the Tor network that can be ported over to Bitcoin? Are there any concepts from Tor that can be ported over to Bitcoin? Um, well, I mean, the whole anonymity thing is it would be an interesting research project. So, you know, I would encourage experimentation with kind of mixing of Bitcoin transactions, and you know, I'm sure people are going to be there. Probably be PhD students who, who, you know, write PhD theses on the optimal mixing and architecture of, you know, anonymity networks involving Bitcoin-like transactions. Um, but again, you know, that is kind of theoretically interesting to me, but <coughs> practically there's so much higher priority that I don't really worry about it. Yeah. You mentioned the problem of finding other nodes on the network through the IRC channel. 
Uh, I'm just wondering if the Tor network has that problem solved. And oh, I don't, I don't if, know the answer to that. That's a good question. I don't know how Tor nodes find each other. Uh, does anybody know? I don't know. We can look at it. I mean, there, there are a few ways of bootstrapping, and any of them will work. It doesn't really matter which one you choose. Um, I should probably stop here and uh, let the next speaker speak. A special thanks to our sponsors, the first, Mt. Gox, mtgox.com. You know them by now. They are the largest exchange for Bitcoins. They are now taking the British pound, Australian dollars, and Canadian dollar should be here any day now. The euro is now here with the Bitomat acquisition. Mt. Gox mobile app is now on the Android market. It allows you to take Bitcoins on the go. And finally, with the USB security device, the YubiKey, it protects your account even on compromised computers. And brought to you by BitPay, that's B-I-T-Pay. They are the official uh, merchant processor for the Bitcoin conference. They allow you to accept payment in Bitcoin and receive US dollars instead. Super simple to integrate into your website. We did it. And finally, they allow you to generate QR codes, invoices, and more. Just a full inclusive merchant solution for Bitcoin. And Mezzi Grill, uh, where authentic Mediterranean food meets modern flavor. They're now serving breakfast. They're right here on 8th Avenue at 55th Street in New York City, just a couple blocks south of Columbus Circle. They are the first brick and mortar to accept and sell bitcoins in new york city there are also worldwide franchising opportunities available and we did eat there for the conference and it was delicious and bitbrew.net all coffee orders are roasted in order to guarantee the freshest possible product they do have organic and fair trade coffees as well as rare and exotic high-end varieties like the jamaican blue mountain that's not a blend, and Darwinian Delight from the Galapagos Island Estate. If you were in the Bitcoin conference, the first uh, few people were able to get free samples of Darwinian Delight, some decaf and other varieties. They do have whole bean or ground ready to order, now shipping internationally at a flat rate, and everything is sold exclusively for Bitcoins using static pricing. Again, that's bitbrew.net.